co-chair of the Psychoanalytic Psychology Committee, um, along with my co-chair, Chuck Lee. So I want to welcome all of you here today. Um, uh, it's a sort of a special occasion. We have a special guest today who um, I will introduce. Uh, Dr. Hedda Bulgar earned her PhD from the University of Vienna in 1934. In the ensuing eight decades, she's enjoyed a stunning career as an eminent psychologist and psychoanalyst. She created the Wright Institute of Los Angeles and was the founder of several other institutions and programs, including uh, the California School for Professional Psychology, uh, the Psychoanalytic Institute LASPS, and the postdoctoral program at Cedar sinai uh, Dr. Bolgar has taught and mentored hundreds of psychoanalysts and psychoanalytically oriented clinicians. She has helped train more than 600 WILA alumni and has influenced countless others, from patients to students to psychoanalytic candidates to supervisees. Uh, she's touched many lives, both directly and indirectly. Uh, the patients she currently sees, some of whom are in their 90s, benefit from her nearly 80 years of experience and wisdom. She's here today to discuss her perspective on psychoanalytic practice. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Volga. Thank you. Well, we'll see if I need this. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Scream if I can, if you can't. Okay. It's really very nice to be here. I haven't had as much contact with LACPA as I would have liked to, but I was the president of LACPA in, I think, 1963. <laughs> there was no place, no psychoanalytic institute, there was no Wright Institute, but there was the postdoctoral program at, at Sinai, and there was one little thing that uh, somehow has never made my biographical sketches, and which really I love and was very proud of. At one point, I saw a patient, and she was depressed, but not too, not suicidal at the moment, and I didn't know what to do with her. It was, it was a consultation, and she needed immediate help, but I didn't know how to get it for her because everybody had a waiting list in those days. And I thought, there's got to be something like a crisis intervention. There hadn't been any at that time. There was no uh, D.D. Hirsch and there was nothing else. Nobody did anything right away. And so I thought, if we could uh, get people to volunteer an hour or two, not more than six, and meet regularly to learn something or train ourselves in this um, difficult, very brief kind of psychotherapy, uh, that would be interesting. And we started it, and it was called the, Psycholo the Psychology Project or something like that. And we set it up with one volunteer uh, intake person and all the members, not of LACPA but of LASCAP in those days, volunteered. You look as though you'd remember something. <laughs> Do you? Oh. Back there? No, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Anyhow, all the members of LASCAP volunteered to take one patient at a time. And we started a crisis intervention program. We saw many, many patients. We had not a single suicide except one with a young boy age 16, who killed himself before he had the first interview with us, unfortunately. That was the one suicide we had. Other than that, we dealt with psychotic breakdowns, with acute suicidal situations. We didn't have a single one, single death or serious accident or anything. Uh, the intake person was a volunteer, very well-trained psychologist. And our idea was that nobody should wait more than at most 24 hours. We should be able to see them within a day of their call. We should see them as close to their residence as possible because people in that state 
shouldn't have to drive and shouldn't have to worry about parking and shouldn't. So we saw them as soon as we could. And uh, we had weekly meetings of talking about what to do and how to do uh, psychotherapy, dynamic psychotherapy, uh, with a limited ending. And the reason was that we really were we wanted to only deal with the crisis. We did not want to do a long-term psychotherapy. We needed to deal with the crisis, problem-solving uh, in a dynamic way. And my formulation for it was that we want to avoid a transference. We want to avoid at least an intensive transference. And we also want to avoid certain amounts of counter-transference. So we really want to deal with the program, and it was, uh, I did quite a bit of work with that, and I started being invited to do uh, workshops in other places. And it became quite a thing until uh, finally the government took over and had mental health centers, and we had uh, Didi Hirsch. And so at that point, we changed to working with children. That was a different story. But that was a really pretty wonderful enterprise we had. And uh, it was very interesting to work with people in, in intensive crisis who could use that kind of basically dynamic psychotherapy, but concentrating on the present and concentrating on the past only in terms of understanding the crisis. So that no, nobody ever talks about that, so I thought I'd tell you about that. It's one of my better <laughs> efforts. May I ask a question? Well, yeah. Um, when you did that, how often uh, would people meet just once a week? Or no, 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 okay. no. People would meet every day maybe, okay. or the first week they would meet maybe three times and then the next time. And everybody knew there was a limit. Mm -hmm. There was an ending to it. Some patients were very quick, they were very clever, and they said, well, um, if I came back, uh, would there be a group? Could you have a group? I said, well, there are groups, and you can certainly go into group therapy. But she wanted us to continue somehow, and that was difficult. It was the only difficulty that even I never saw anybody for more than five hours because I figured comfort <laughs> transference develops sometimes in a crisis faster than it does in long-term therapy. So that was interesting. Anyway, I just wanted to for once mention that thing because in all my biographical stuff it's never mentioned and it was sort of one of my favorite enterprises. Okay, so. Uh, there are two things we can do today. If you have things you want to talk about, let's just have questions, dialogue. Uh, if you don't want that, I can take an interview that was done by Michael Diamond with me, and it's the, the end, the last chapter of the book, which my institute, Second Century of Psychoanalysis, um, evolving perspectives on therapeutic action. Um, this is a, um, a book that was published by Karnak, and we had a second edition practically after a month of it being out. So it's obviously a book that's selling well. And the last section is uh, an interview, and I can ask the questions. I'm not going to read you anything, but I thought those were good questions, and so we can talk about that. If you would like that, I'll do that, anything you want. <laughs> so shall we do that? Yeah? I had a question related to your biography. You have a question? Yeah. Okay. You mentioned, I think, on our last occasion meeting that you were um, on the Committee of Social Thought. It was, you participated in that at the University of Chicago? At the University of Chicago, Chicago. yeah. What was that like, and was there a, uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it was, 
the University of Chicago had uh, not really departments the way American uh, universities do. Uh, they had institutes and they had committees. And this happened to be a very, very exciting committee which combined social sciences, sociology, and a number of others that went with it, social, and was called the Committee on Social Thought. And it was discussing essentially social issues. Uh, it was one that I was occasionally on. And uh, there was another committee, which was the Committee on Human Development, and that was really the most clinical committee at the University of Chicago. The department, the institute, the psychological institute was an extremely rich and wonderful enterprise and we did everything. We did infant observation and we did um, a study on unemployment and we did a study on um, packaging chocolates <laughs> <laughs> and we had the regular psychology program and particular emphasis on the um, developmental uh, view of the life cycle, sort of like Erickson, only different. And so we did a lot of that. It was a great department. But um, social thought, yeah, I think every analyst should have some connection with social issues. But uh, I don't want to talk about the, the University of Chicago, mostly because I don't remember it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question, Hedda. Um, you're one of the only people, probably the only, per you know, the only person in Los Angeles who's actually met or heard Freud speak. And <laughs> I would love to hear you talk about that. I heard Freud once. He was very old, he was very sick, he had had 23 jaw surgeries for his cancer. Uh, I could, we didn't have <clears throat> even good microphones or anything. Um, I could hardly hear him, his voice was very, very low. He was a very sick, very old man. And I can't tell you what it was like, except that it was Freud. <laughs> <laughs> and it was sort of, you know, you finally got to see the prophet. Where did you hear? What? Where? 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 In the University of, of um, yeah, I guess it must have been the University of Vienna. Oh. Yeah. He could never be a full professor at that time because he was Jewish and he wouldn't convert to any Christian religion. Mm -hmm. So he never had a full professorship. But um, actually psychoanalysis was very unknown and uh, not very uh, much pushed by anything at the University of Vienna, his city, mine at that time. There was one course in psychotherapy and that was given in the urology department. <laughs> Not neurology, urology. <laughs> because some bright physician thought that maybe male impotence has something to do with feelings or <laughs> <laughs> uh, emotions. And so we had, uh, we had a very good course in psychotherapy, one, in the medical school, not in psychology. However, some people from the Psychoanalytic Institute would come visiting, and one person who was a child psychoanalyst came to the psychology department because he wanted to, to learn about academic child psychology. Uh, he became a good friend of mine. It turned out he was, had been a friend of my mother's. <laughs> so, and Rene Spitz was... Uh, fairly well-known analyst in his day and in his field. He is the one actually who uh, wrote most of his articles about the fact that babies who don't get attention, loving, loving care, 
are not thriving or will not thrive, and some of them will die if all they have is physical care. If they get fed and cleaned and nobody talks to them and holds them and loves them, they will die. And he was the first one who talked, who wrote about that. So he was coming to the psychology department to study psych uh, uh, academic psychology. Uh, we did child observation, infant observation, which is a requirement now in every psychoanalytic institute, uh, except we did it for 24 hours. <laughs> and the analytic observation is something like once a week, I guess. Uh, we were very interested in the interactions. This was an institution, of course. We didn't go to the families. It was institutional. And we were interested in the interaction with the nursing staff and with the other babies and with the visitors of the other babies and their own, of course, if they had any. So it was interesting. It probably uh, kind of trained me to be multifaceted, to not have one uh, central thing that is the only thing. I, I don't, you know, orientations are something psychoanalytic orientations that I am not crazy about. I think all orientations, so-called, have contributed to analytic theory and analytic technique, and the more the better. But use them all appropriately, know what they are, become familiar with it, see what you work best with. But. Uh, it's important to, to look at uh, the human existence in a lot of different ways. That's always been something that I've learned probably in my very extensive and varied early psychological training. Yeah. Hedda, I'm sure you know that you are an amazing role model for all of us. <laughs> And it's so thrilling to be here to hear you speak today, so thank you for coming. I, I'm i curious to find out about how you practice now, how many people you see, mm -hmm. and if you could tell us something personal about yourself and your secret to longevity and alertness and health and well-being. Mm -hmm. That would be really special. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, I have about uh, 10, 12 patients. Some of them come three times a week, some of them come twice a week. Very few of them come once a week. Um, some of them are relatively new, and I hate to admit that, because for years I've been saying I will not take any new patients. <laughs> it's not fair, it's terrible, you get them to uh, attach to you and then you die or you have to retire or whatever. And I've said for years and years I will not accept a new patient, I'll do consultations and refer. Well, somehow or other, <laughs> <laughs> I have a few relatively new patients. Um, I did the Alexander Lecture last March, I think. That's a rather prestigious lecture, and since I have worked with Alexander, was trained at Franz Alexander's Institute since he was responsible for my being in Los Angeles because he got this fabulous Ford Foundation grant of a quarter million dollars those days, 1956, mm -hmm. to study the psychoanalytic process. It was quite a, an event, and he asked me to join him to come to Los Angeles <coughs> and work with him in that, in, on that project, and also become the psychologist, chief psychologist of the newly founded 
Mount Sinai Hospital that later on it became Cedar Sinai, but that was Mount Sinai. And it was the Young Turks of psychoanalysis who <laughs> founded it. So it was all very exciting, and it took me half a year to decide to leave Chicago and leave the Chicago, leave Chicago University. But, and finally I, I said to him, he called about twice a week to find out if I would join him. <laughs> and I finally said, why is it so, I'm flattered, I'm honored, but why, why is it so important to you? And he said, well, I know what kind of an analyst you are because I trained you. <laughs> and, and I know you must know something about research because you did all those dissertations at the University of Chicago. <laughs> So actually, I had a, I was involved in about 60 doctoral dissertations, some chairing and some just in the committee. So he found out about that, and uh, so he said, you are the person I want. And I said, well, uh, I'm flattered, I'm honored, I'm glad you think so. But still, why is it so important? And he said, well, I haven't signed my own contract because I have to know who my staff is going to be. Mm. Okay, so finally I did agree to come to leave Chicago and come to Los Angeles. Uh, so Franz Alexander was a, a very big influence in my life, certainly an analytic te theory, analytic technique. Um, but there were many others too, uh, not personally, but when they came up with a new theory, I was really excited. Every time somebody came up with a new theory, I thought, well, hooray, this is something that, that enlarges psychoanalysis, enriches psychoanalysis, gives us options, this is great. And so every new thing that came along, yeah, you should read it, you should know about it, and you should see whether you can use it or not. There, there are some things that maybe are not compatible with your own personality. So you don't use it, and you don't work with it, and other things are, and so you work with it. Uh, so back to my practice. Um, I have, I'm seeing people I have seen for well, 15 years. Um, I have two people who, whom I saw. Of course, I saw a lot of people as candidates. So, you know, half the, tr the training analysts now are my patients or were my patients. Some finished the training, the train, the requirements for the, as a tra to become an analyst at the institute. <laughs> And many years later, they came back because life changes and life brings crisis and problems, even if you are an analyst and even if you are a training analyst. So they came back. And so I have people whom I have seen maybe for 15 years to begin with, and then for another 10, 15 years now. And I have about two such people whom I have seen for a long, long time. I have seen one patient who was very, very disturbed, very gifted, very bright, very interesting woman, lesbian, but she also had really terribly deep, early, intense, traumatic problems. I have seen her, I don't know, 20 years maybe. I now see her once or twice a month, just kind of to keep in touch to, to, as she says, every time I come in here, you say one thing that's really relevant. <laughs> 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 okay, so um, I have one patient in analysis who comes in twice a week. And that re that's a, she is a very interesting example and an answer to the question, do you really have to see people four or five times a week? Well, the answer is, who is it? This one said to me very early, 
her husband was in four times a week analysis, and I raised the question how she feels about the difference. And she said, you know, of course it would be nice to see you four times a week, but really I don't think I could use it. She said, it takes me a day and sometimes two days to process one hour we have here. Now, twice a week is perfect. If I had to see you every day, uh, it would all pile up and I wouldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything, so it wouldn't work. So twice a week is about right for me. And I've learned a lot from her because it really works that way for her. She comes in, she has a lot of questions, a lot of associations to the last hour. She always, almost always has a dream. Um, she's on the couch. She is an analytic patient. I don't see her outside. We have a frame that we observe, not entirely, because I don't, I don't think the frame is all that great, I think needs a little um, trimming occasionally. <laughs> um, anyhow, I see uh, a few people once a week, but they're all people who uh, do some processing during the week, who've been in analysis before, uh, who have maybe coming out of a life crisis. One of my patients, um, he lost a very, very lucrative business, and his wife came down with very, very serious cancer all at the same time, and that changed his life and his view of, his, of life and view of himself, and he really needed to come and kind of rearrange his life with that experience, with the great loss, two great losses, and a whole question of, of what was his life like and what is it going to be and how to handle the cancer situation. So he had some very good reason. He had had a lot of analysis before, but he wanted to come and talk about those things and try to get himself a new a new future. So, but he can come in only once a week and he does a lot. And every once in a while he comes in with a drawing or a collage or something that where he expresses some of his solutions, some of his questions and some of his solutions. Um, who else do I see? Well, I see one person in analysis three times a week. He can't make it to four, but I don't care. <laughs> well, I think really people very often have been uh, rejected by analysts because they couldn't make the four times or the five times who would have really needed and been able to use analysis. And this is somebody who needs analysis. He happens to be a psychiatrist. Uh, he doesn't particularly consider it part of his training or anything. It's also resolving his very complicated life. And uh, he's in a different culture from mine. And that also raises issues. I don't know how many of you work with, with patients who are in a different culture and how it works for you and what the problems are. Uh, it's different when something that sounds very traumatic to me, and then I find out that this is cultural, that this is, that everybody in his culture has gone through this. So does it make it less traumatic because it's the part of the culture that's, I don't know yet. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that uh, just because everybody goes through 
some very painful stuff, but it makes it easier. It makes it a little harder to be really angry with the cause, with the people who caused the, the pain. But it's, uh, you know, if everybody has to go through it, so that's life. It's a little different when our patients, our, our American patients, uh, finally discover traumatic things caused by their parents. It's difficult to be angry with your parents for many people, and it takes a while to, to free them to express some of their own feelings about it. But at least it's not part of the culture, it's an individual experience. So these are all complicated considerations. Um, does that give you a picture of, of what I do? Yes, you talked about your practice, the second part of my question, mm -hmm. and it was a genuine question, was what is your secret to longevity, alertness, health, oh. and well-being? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, a general question, and it really, my answer depends a little bit on who asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just had my picture and some um, results of an interview in the Oprah magazine, heaven help us. <laughs> 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 well, if you have a chance to see it, the only good thing about it is it's an old picture. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's okay. It's, I mean, I, I did say those things, except they abbreviated and they made them kind of more general than I meant them. So it's hard to be interviewed over the phone by somebody who doesn't know you and, and has only the, the magazine's um, world to, to put me into. But anyway, so it depends on who asks the question. Okay. There are some things that, well, <laughs> okay, I've been a vegetarian since I was 14, and I became a vegetarian because I didn't want to kill, because I suddenly realized that this wonderful tasting stuff is another creature's life, and death, and probably pain, <coughs> painful death. So I didn't want any part of it. And I've done it whenever I could. There were times in my life which was a life of including wars and revolutions and counter-revolutions and famines and whatnot. So I couldn't always do it. There was a time I was lucky to be invited, and I couldn't really very well say, sorry, I won't eat this. <laughs> so I would eat it. So the, it's not complete, but it's all these years since I was 14. I think that does really have an effect on my physical health. Now, the last few years, physis physicians have said, oh, that accounts for your good immune system and for everything else. I remember all the years when they said, oh, but you need animal protein. <laughs> oh, that's very bad. You really shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it has really changed. Our culture has changed very considerably. People now are admitting and saying without embarrassment they are vegans, they are vegetarians. So anyway, that's one aspect. Um, the other aspect is, I feel I was very lucky, particularly with my first year of life. My father was getting his PhD. My mother was on leave of absence from her uh, newspaper. She was the one and only uh, full-time female staff member on a big German language newspaper in Budapest, and she was on a leave of absence, and she had nothing to do but to play with me. <laughs> so I had my parents to myself as much 
doing a dissertation. You know, it's, it's a pain, but it's not totally time consuming. So I had a lot of time with my parents the first year of my life. Um, I had a reasonably untraumatic life in general, or I was raised to deal with mm -hmm. trauma. Uh, I was also raised to feel responsible for everything that happens in the world, <laughs> which goes with all that. My father was a social activist. He was a revolutionary. He was a diplomat. He was a scholar. Um, I never heard him raise his voice. Never. Nobody argued in my family. My mother and my grandmother would, would have arguments, but I always said that that was labor versus management. <laughs> well, that, that was an acceptable argument. Uh, and it was uh, because my grandmother didn't treat the maids uh, the way my mother thinks she should have. <laughs> that was the labor versus management. I never heard anybody raise their voice in anger. Uh, it helps. It doesn't quite help with working analytically because I don't get, I have a hard time getting a negative transference. It's, uh, it's uh, a little difficult. I now have one really massive one and it's in a way, it's delicious because it's never <laughs> happened before. <laughs> and because I can use something that I was trained to use. So, but in general, it's, it's no fun. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, I tried to live in the past, in the present, and in the future. And I still live in the future, too, because I still come up with ideas for new plans and new, uh, I don't think I'm going to start a new institution, <laughs> but I really want to start some new work. And uh, I'm, it's very much in the beginning, and I don't know whether it'll ever happen, but it's something that, if I can do it, will take my attention, my energy, and collaboration with other people. Uh, one thing that I think really has to do with longevity is not worrying a lot about things. I don't worry about, try to wor not worry about things that haven't happened yet. The, the catastrophic stuff that Kernberg talks about uh, where you assume ev something awful is going to happen. Uh, you are going to get sick, somebody is going to die, somebody is going to, uh, I don't know, do something to your financial situation. Uh, all of these things that people worry about, just in case. Well, I try not to do that. When I catch myself worrying about something, I cut down on it. So, in effect, I'm trying to cut down on stress. Um, unnecessary stress. Life is stressful, you can't help that. The other thing is to be part of your community, your society, your whatever, to work with other people, to uh, When I founded all of those things or started them or whatever, that I think was um, following my father's admonition that when there is an unmet need, you meet it. So if there is no good clinical psychology training, you start a school. Um, When there is an unmet need, you meet it. When there is a problem, you try to solve it. 
you don't worry about it, you don't complain about it, you, uh, you can do all that, but mostly try to solve it. Try to think of some way it can be, so it can be solved. You don't have to do it yourself, but think of some way it can be solved. Start, start a group, start working with a group. Um, LACE has a trauma center. Uh, it started the Soldiers Project. I don't know how many you know about Soldiers Project, but it's, it's one of those enterprises to really meet an unmet need. And that was part of the original group. I, being a psychoanalyst isn't always a good thing. Uh, I left the group after the initial, after it was started and worked, because a patient of mine was very interested in it and gave it a lot of time and and it was, I would have had too much contact with her and we would have maybe agreed or disagreed about things at a time when maybe that wasn't the issue or when that wasn't necessarily what would have helped her analysis. So I gave it up and I withdrew from it, but the Soldiers Project did very well without me. And they still do an occasional supervision or something like that. So I don't know whether that gives you an idea of yeah. Um, currently now, what do you th what do you observe in terms of the whole psychoanalytic training and world in Los Angeles? I mean, it seems to me there are a lot of institutes. I have friends in all kinds of institutes, and I wonder, like, are they really going to have enough patients? Is it really getting supported in the community? I mean, that's one question. But in general, you probably have many more observations because of what you see and hear. Well. I will tell you my experience and observations, but I would like to quote you an article by Kernberg in the latest journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association. And the article is called Suicide Prevention for Institutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he talks about both things. He talks about the isolation, about the lack of making connection with academic institutions, with other uh, institutes that are part of the healing professions, that, uh, that institutes are isolated and institutes are um, terrified at the idea of, of sharing anything with any other institute. Um, we have been trying to do some combining of institutes. It never works. It would somehow or other kill the individuality of one of them at least. Uh, it's, it's always, they, they like to be isolated. They like to stay uh, with what they know. They are afraid of, of moving out. It's not, there, there are differences. Uh, Lace is very willing to, to get into social issues, which I'm sure has something to do with my uh, orientation. And, uh, but then there are some others that are strictly psychoanalytic. You can be a citizen, you can, as a citizen, you can do a lot of things, but as a psychoanalyst, you can't, and the institutes can't. Um, it depends. There, there is a, but anyhow, Kernberg's article will tell you all about, uh, they, he thinks that the institutes are committing suicide, and the other thing is this constant emphasis of the numbers. A candid, the candidates don't get control cases because nobody wants to come in for the, four days a week. And currently, of course, with the economic situation, it's a little hard to get people to come in four days a week. So, and some institutes are still arguing. My institute is now discussing whether maybe, since we require three control cases, three supervised cases, 
for graduation. Maybe the third case could come in only three times a week. And that's only because the international doesn't require three cases. They only require two cases. So the third case is our own special ambitious entity <laughs> uh, undertaking. So maybe on that we could cut one hour. And it's the number crunching that really makes for the isolation of, of psychoanalysis at the moment. So that's a, a real issue. Yeah. I haven't read the Oprah magazine yet, and I'm sure it will continue to contribute to an over-idealization of you. Uh, that said, uh, I was thinking about what you said about longevity, and I think uh, what you said about living in the space between new and old, yeah. and your capacity to, um, in terms of your work and your approach, and maybe presence in the room with the patient, to be able to live in that space, I think, is important, not just to longevity, but perhaps to the practice of analysis. That said, you mentioned the aggression that you connected with when you were 14 and found yourself turning to, um, to become a vegetarian. Yeah. In Berlin at the Institute, they were beginning to examine aggression in a very uh, broader sense, uh, moving beyond Freud and talking about love and hate, mm -hmm. love, hate and aggression involved in every psychosexual stage. I was wondering, and you yourself, I mean, I'm being a little tangential, obviously were close to what had gone down in Europe, yeah. if not physically, yeah. had endured that kind of uh, uh, tsunami, to say the least. Yeah. With all that, and your work with 24-hour observation of babies, yeah. when uh, Abraham or whoever in that group began to talk about the cannibalistic aspects of a baby sucking on the nipple, yeah. interjecting, and um, having an aggressive uh, or hate-filled aspect to their orientation to the mother, yeah. beginning to enter. What is your thoughts on that? And I'm asking it again under the umbrella of, and maybe other people perhaps are interested in, what in the old can we still stay with that you think has merit? And what is new that you've grown to appreciate in, in your journey? Uh, in terms of, and that's a broad, I mean, it can be narrowed down in a specific case, but anyway. Just throwing that up. Well, uh, aggression entered psychoanalysis. I mean, the, for Freud, after World War One, because World War One was a horrendous war, and millions and millions of people died in horrendous ways, and Freud had to deal with it somehow, and that's when aggression entered was added to sexuality, and those were the drives. And now we are blessed with that, no matter whether it's true, whether we want it, whether it's universal, but we always have to consider aggression. Well, there is aggression, of course, uh, in a variety of forms. Some of it is necessary, defensive, some of it is protective, some of it is an expression of a reaction to something that was done to the person. I mean, sure, there is anger, there is rage, there is hate. My God, uh, we had the Holocaust, we have uh, horrendous things going on in the world. So there is obviously anger. But I don't think that the baby nursing at the mother's breast is cannibalistic. <laughs> that is one of those um, extremes. Somebody who has a hard time accepting aggression and so it has to make it about 10 times worse than it is. Um, that's ridiculous. Anybody who has watched 
babies nursing. And I am right in the middle of it. I have become the great grandmother <laughs> of a baby. And the baby has wonderful parents. And the mother is very aware of the importance of the physical touch and the physical connection. And I've watched breastfeeding, and she does it beautifully and very happily. And I don't think there is the baby is acting out some aggression, cannibalistic impulses. The baby is getting food, and baby likes food every two hours. <laughs> so, I mean, those are the extremes that I can't go along with, never have. But I think there is very legitimate and very sometimes very constructive anger. When people get anger in, angry in political situations, and try to make changes. I think that's constructive and that's a good use of anger. Uh, yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Um, two questions I'm throwing in. Um, so I was thinking about how if you had thoughts about therapeutic change, and I understand that you know, it closely depends on the, the analytic couple on what would be most important and what would stand out to you and what you've seen anecdotally. And then I was wondering, I haven't seen you talk that much, how much you talk about your counter, are you comfortable talking about your counter-transference and how you respond with your counter-transference? Okay. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> for the first part of your question, I think what is really important because we always go for rem uh, remembering traumatic things, for bringing up repressed memories and all that. Uh, so we are basically putting the patient through pain. And the question sometimes is, you know, why, why make people suffer? And why does it, uh, maybe does it do any good? And I think it's not, and it's a repetition of the old stuff. And I want to remind everybody that it's not the repeti repetition of the old stuff because it's done with somebody. The original trauma was experienced alone, usually helplessly, and maybe with rage, maybe without rage, but certainly whatever suffering there was had to be endured alone. Here there is somebody. And the, the real trick is to be there, to what I call be alone with the patient, to exclude everything that interferes with being with the patient and the patient's tremendous feelings, painful or otherwise. So that's one thing. Uh, what was the other part of, of your question? Are you comfortable talking about your... Oh, about counter-transference. Um, counter-transference is a very general, over-general concept, I think, because it, it deals with the patient's, with, with the therapist's feelings, uh, part of the therapist's participation in, in the dialogue, or even not in the dialogue, but just being there, feeling certain things. Um, yeah, that I have very intense feelings when the patient is particularly in real pain. Um, I, I, I do what um, Stolarev says uh, is helpful, and he says, you look for the analog, you search for the analog in yourself. You try to match the experience that the patient has with something that you had, that you have experienced that's similar. So I'm trying, I'm kind of searching, I'm walking quickly around the, my landscape. When did I feel something like this? And that comes up as counter-transference. It's my feeling, but I know what it's like, and I can now maybe 
understand uh, or tolerate or whatever the patient's pain, suffering a little better. Um, do I ever feel annoyed? <laughs> you know, really, really, very rarely, I must admit, uh, it's rare. I feel regret, I feel compassion, I feel, uh, I wish you didn't do that. <laughs> um, I don't think it really goes into much more negative. I'll tell you very quickly about one of my, it's in the book too, about a patient who was totally unlike me in every way and what happened there. It was a young man, he was, I don't know how he came to me, but he, he said his life wasn't going right and he was, uh, he didn't know what to do and he was very angry. He had been a policeman and the police fired him because he was too violent. That's pretty violent. And uh, so he was very angry, he was only doing his job. And uh, anyway, and now he was, he, what he was doing most of the time, he was driving around the freeways. He had a gun, a loaded gun on the next seat, and he was looking for some nigger to do something bad so he can shoot him. He slept with a loaded rifle and was hoping that somebody would break in so he could shoot them. And this was all he said, that and the guy who fired him at the police. And this went on session week after week. I saw him once a week. Session after session. Oh, and he also told me he never pays his doctor's bills. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I just said very quietly, you'll pay mine. <laughs> and he said, wow, you think so? Well, no. I said, okay. <laughs> well, uh, I listened to this week after week. He never said anything else. And so one day I decided to make an intervention. Not an interpretation, an intervention. There's a difference. And he started again on the same stuff about the niggers and everything. And I looked at him and I said, you must have had a terrible childhood. And he looked at me and he burst into tears. And he said, how did you know? Nobody knows. I never talk about it. I said, I noticed that. And from then on, everything changed, totally. Mm -hmm. He stopped doing that. He found a girlfriend, a lovely, lovely girl, who was my co-therapist. <laughs> <laughs> well, she became my co-therapist. She really, she <laughs> did everything that a good therapist does. She never criticized him. She, she never made demands on him. She loved, she really loved him. He was very handsome, very attractive. And she made him pay his bills, and she made him, <laughs> <laughs> and she made him find a job, and she was really, she was perfect. And everything changed with that one comment of, you must have had a terrible childhood. So, you know, that's in a way your answer. That was my counter-transference. I was uh, listening to this and listening to this, and what it said to me was, my God, this, this guy must have had some terrible trauma. I mean, nobody drives around the freeways with a loaded gun, come on. I mean, well, there you have aggression <laughs> that is a result of some terrible trauma, very traumatic life. Nobody should have it the way. And we talked about it, and the fact that he, for the first time in his life, told somebody about it. And the somebody listened and felt with him, and felt for him, it was all very new experience, and that was what made for the change. 
Yeah. Okay, now I have two questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, one is sort of a follow-up on that one, which is um, there must have been something as angry as he was that brought him into therapy, which I'm kind of curious about because it sounds like he was so stuck, but he was still willing to come. I don't know what how he came or how he was referred or whether... He had gotten into trouble, and this was a, a oh, sort of, uh, more or less. Uh, and the other question is, I, I'm just wondering how you got into psychology. Oh, <laughs> you want to know that? Any feminists around here? <laughs> um, I was 18 years old. I had finished the secondary school, which at the end of it has a big uh, four-day examination. And if you pass it, that entitles you to register at the university. There's no college. The four years of college, eh, don't, they don't exist. So you go into the university and you go into uh, one of the major schools, um, medicine, law, philosophy, um, theology. Uh, philosophy can contains everything, absolutely. Mathematics, geography, uh, psychology, the works. I didn't know what I wanted. They don't have counseling or anything like that. They didn't then. And you are now an adult, and you make your own choices and decisions. So I look at the catalog, and I decided, well, I don't know what I want. So I'm going to register for everything that says introduction to. I ended up with 10 courses, <laughs> and one was psychology. And the psychology professor was such a wonderful teacher. I sit on the, I really sat on the edge of my chair when he talked about something like, I don't know, sensation or perception, really interesting stuff. But he was so enthusiastic, and he was so concerned, and he talked to us. He didn't read his lectures. He talked to us, and he was just very, very, uh, he wasn't seductive, but he was somebody who was really, who made the subject interesting, no matter how boring it might have been. And I thought, well, this sounds good. <laughs> and then I looked at the psychology department, at the institutes, special program, and there were all kinds of interesting things, and I thought, well, this sounds like something I might want to do. So that's how I got into it. And the reason uh, I got into all of this was because I was registering, and it was beyond the deadline. There was a five-day grace period, but you had to go to the dean of the faculty to get permission to register, to register. And I go and register, show him all my stuff. And he says, I will use your being late as an excuse. I will not admit you. And I said, is there anything wrong with my papers or what? No, no, there's nothing wrong with it. But I don't think women belong into the university. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, OK. You know, it's legal. Women do, according to our constitution and the laws of the country, women do belong into the university. Well, I said, I don't think so. Uh, and I said, well, what, what if next year, oh, next semester, I register the first day? Well, he said, that's six months from now. I hope that some idiot will marry you in the meantime and you'll forget about the university. That's when I decided, well, this is ridiculous. He is an idiot. Uh, and I walked across uh, campus and decided to go into the philosophy. And this was social sciences, the other one. And then I got into philosophy with, with the endless uh, topics and endless fields. And so I picked the 10 introductions. So that's how I got into it. I was determined to go into the social sciences. 
social science, political science, and whatnot, but he wouldn't let me, so I, so I landed in psychology. So it was is so it's the dean or something of social science wouldn't let yeah, you in? Yeah, okay. yeah. So there was we are. a little are. bit of Karen Horn on you. What? Was there a little bit of Karen Horn on in you? Uh, <laughs> well, I knew her. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Well, I certainly was a feminist. My mother was a feminist. She wrote the, the big um, request for the vote for women to the prime minister. Didn't work then. <laughs> but I learned something. I have a, an article I talked, gave a talk, one of the, what was it? Uh, Division 39 of the APA, and that was on the four waves of feminist, feminism, and I was one of the speakers, and I talked about feminism. And um, when I was seven years old, my mother, who was a feminist, had a meeting. I mean, she had meetings all the time, but she invited me to come and sit in and <laughs> see what she was doing. I was seven years old, and as I was sitting there, uh, one of the members, young actress, very good looking, came in and she was swinging a pair of shoes in the air and she says, I'm sorry I'm late but I just got these shoes and I am so glad I can get my shoes without having to ask a man for permission. Mm -hmm. I buy my own clothes and my own shoes. And that was very impressive to me. And the other thing was the conversation about getting the vote. So I knew that you had to get the vote, and you had to be independent of a man or anybody else. You had to be, you had to develop yourself. You had to have self-sufficiency, and you have to be able to participate in the society. And that I knew when I was seven. I walked out of it with this feeling, oh, there are two things I have to remember. Yeah, you have to be independent and you have to be allowed to participate in the decisions of the whole country. Okay, that was my basis for feminism. <laughs> yeah. So far you've talked about um, the importance of being involved socially in the community. You've talked about your family and your upbringing yeah. being strong and stable. You've talked about your nutritional vegetarianism. Yeah. You haven't spoken yet about your own sense of spirituality, your own sense of love of learning, which apparently started very early on. So that's obvious. But I'm curious about the spirituality and if that's been a factor for you, and do you incorporate that into the work that you do? And also about being physically active. Oh. <laughs> well, I was a dancer. When I was started, I started late. I started at 14, I think. Um, I was a dancer until I had a very, very bad appendectomy. I almost died, I had peritonitis, I had the works, and my surgeon said to me, for a year you can't exercise or move or do anything, which was ridiculous of course, but that was the way. And he said, you know, that scar has to heal, and one of these days you're going to get married and you'll keep running to me, do something about the scar. Culture. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, so for a year, uh, a dancer doesn't do nothing physical for a year. That's the end of dancing. That's how I got into the academic stuff. That's why I decided, okay, I'll go to the university. Uh, you know, love of learning is something that I don't really feel I have. Things come. I don't really go after them. I mean, things, 
I pick up stuff from just about everybody every time. But uh, I got through it all, and I got a PhD, and I got, did, did write a dissertation and all that. But it's not really, I don't have an awful lot of curiosity <laughs> about things. I have curiosity about the patient who sits next to me, across the whatever to me. But I, uh, uh, my friends, certainly, I want to know about them. But information, I hardly ever finish an article when I read it. <laughs> <laughs> I learned enough, I think, to be able to teach in a way that people understand. And I don't like technical terminology. Yeah, I haven't used any. I have answered a question about countertransference. <laughs> but I try not to use um, jargon in any way. So sometimes it gets difficult. It's hard to find a word that isn't. But uh, I think there is a, a kind of, well, I don't know. I think there is a real grandiosity there with, uh, about my knowing everything anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I once in, in school had to reinvent Hamlet. We had a homework assignment, we were supposed to read Hamlet, and I didn't get around to it very much. And uh, somehow I got called upon, and I made it up. <laughs> I made it up, obviously I'd heard enough talk about it. Uh, my mother had read everything and she knew everything, so I'm sure at some point there was a conversation about Shakespeare and a conversation about her. Hamlet and conversation about the problem, and so I made it up. <laughs> Not all of it, fortunately, I didn't have to talk about all of it. I started this, and, and then, you know, the teacher asked somebody else to continue. I got away with it. <laughs> and ever since that time, I think I have a feeling that uh, whatever I need to know, I'll know when I need it. <laughs> It's, um, you know, I do read, and I have read a lot more, and I've written articles that require a certain amount of reading, so it's it's not consistent, but it's not a, a, a burning thing, you know. It's not that I've got to read something. No, but it's obvious that you, you do what you love, and you follow your passion. Yeah, and I love a lot of things. Yeah. So could you comment on aspects of spirituality? Oh, yeah, spirituality. Okay. Any Buddhists in the room? Sort of. Okay. Okay. All right. So when I say I don't worry about things that haven't happened, that's my Buddhist. Um, I haven't talked really about some of the other things. The compassion, of course, is really something I've tried ever since. I don't know. When I was 14, 14 was a very important time in my life. I read a book. It was called The Light of Asia. And it was essentially the story of Gautama Buddha, his story and his teachings and his life. And the light of Asia was Buddha. I couldn't put that thing down. That was not a book I didn't finish. <laughs> uh, I couldn't put it down. I was completely fascinated by it. And I thought this was really it. And uh, my mother was rather along with it, with, with me on it, and we both sort of were interested. We were interested in Oriental philosophy. Anyhow, we were interested in Hinduism, we were interested in theosophy, which was the, the, the European version of it. Uh, so I was very involved in that from age 14 on. Then I met Krishnamurti, mm -hmm. and that was another one. So I knew him quite well. Mm -hmm. And 
I met him also at the same time. It was, and I went to the camps every summer mm. in Holland. There were Christian would would have a camp. And there would be lectures, and I was also at the one when he decided he was not the world teacher, and he was dissolving the um, order of the star, which was supposed to kind of launch him as the the world teacher, which would have been a, a successor to Muhammad and to Jesus and to Buddha and all the rest of it. And uh, he said, I'm not that. I'm thinking about things. I'm trying to solve issues. I will continue to think, but uh, um, truth is a pathless land. You find your own way. Everybody finds their own way. I will share mine with you. Doesn't mean it's yours. All that was very, very much the way I liked it. Um, well, there is dying, death and dying, of course. Death. Um, I don't have any conventional beliefs. Um, I think there is, and this is very personal and just because I guess it, it suits me, but I think that there is some kind of permanent, continued conscience after death. I don't think there is uh, any form of, of uh, heaven, hell, or any of those things. I don't think there is a uh, physical reconstruction of the body ever. I don't believe in, in any of that, but I do believe in a continued sort of consciousness. That's all I can say. Maybe that's, I don't know whether that contributes to longevity or not, but uh, I'm in no hurry to get there. <laughs> uh, well, my grandfather said, I don't remember that, he said that to me. He said, you know, I don't think dying is going to be any fun, but I can't wait to see what happens afterwards. And I think this somehow got into my system. Um, I've had a strange life in, in many ways. I have all my family, never, never, there wasn't anybody uh, who had a long illness. My father did, but I wasn't there. My father died of, of Parkinson's. But everybody else got sick on Monday and was dead by Friday. It was unexpected sometimes. It was maybe could happen, but by Friday everybody was dead. So I had never had this business of sitting with somebody who I cared about, waiting, see, or, or whatever. So in a way, that's uh, something that probably is missing in my life. My husband died at the dinner table, totally unexpectedly, when I was 64. But, uh, and I still talk to him. And he talks to me. We have long conversations. He doesn't like the political situation any better than I do. <laughs> so, does that answer it? Okay. Anything else? Yeah. So I remember earlier you alluded to that you hold the frame kind of lightly, you'll, and I was wondering, I've been practicing a while now, but I remember early on in, when I was practicing that I was worried about the analytic beliefs and held, stopped, <laughs> <laughs> you were worried. concerned about my frame. But I was wondering, um, not so much anymore, but wondering, are there any times when you've done something where you were doubting 
is this, is this, uh, am I breaking the frame in a way that's not helpful? Oh, I have one memory, it's in the book, uh, about a patient where I wished I had, I had broken the frame, but I didn't. <laughs> And I really decided that afterwards and later that we never really examined the frame. I, I want to know what's the frame made of. And some people treat it as though it were made of iron or very hard wood. And I decided that's not me. My, my frame is made of rubber. It's uh, flexible. No, the only, I don't think I, I, I break the frame all the time. Uh, I don't go for this business with no presents because, <laughs> yeah, I had one patient. I was probably doing it very carefully and very, very <laughs> religiously. But I had a patient who came in the first Christmas. She started analysis in April, and this was the first Christmas. And she came in with 12 beautifully wrapped presents. And I said, oh my God, what do I do now? And so I asked her, you know, why so many? And what, why, what, I don't know, I tried to not shock her and not be ungrateful and not, you know. And I commented on how beautiful they looked. And I said, why so many? And she said, well, everybody goes crazy around Christmas time and they all talk about shopping and they all are angry because they can't get what they want. And I don't have anybody to give a gift to. So I wanted to be like everybody else, and I did some shopping, and I did all that, and I got really excited about it, and I wrapped the things, that, and I said, yeah, they're beautiful, there. And I said, but I am really not supposed to accept any presents from you, from any patient. And she said, oh, but, you know, I really want you to have this, and I really, and, and I said finally, okay, we'll spend a lot of time looking at them, and anything that relates to our work, I'll be happy to keep. Anything that is just beautiful, I think maybe I'll have to let go even if I don't want to. And we started opening it. And there were a lot of, there were some books, there were some records. They all had, there was a book of poetry which had meaning. And she showed me how it related to our work. And she had, um, she, there were a couple of her own paintings. She was an artist. There was, um, and then there were wonderful clothes. There was a scarf, a beautiful silk scarf. And she said, well, you, Wore, this would, this fits the suit that you wore the first time I saw you. Mm. And there were things like that. There was some jewelry and that, that I said, you know, this is valuable. And I'm really, we, we don't want to mix it up with real value. I understand the symbolic meanings and I understand the emotional meanings and, and that we can do together. But, so she took some of them back, and I kept some. And she was very happy with my wearing the scarf, and she was very happy with some of those things. And she also made me a little Christmas tree. She made it from scratch, everything. And it was very densely decorated. And one little book said Freud, <laughs> and she had, she had things from her dream, from her dreams that we had worked on, animals and things. Mm -hmm. And it was a densely decorated little tree. And I still have it, and I still put it out every Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that's her gift. So at that point, I think the frame is wrong. I think there are motivations in the patient that should be honored and should be understood and should not be rejected. I think rejecting an offer from a patient uh, is not therapeutic. I don't think that works well. It may make the patient angry or some patient, but we are really not in the business of just because we'd like a negative transference. <coughs> just because we want to be able to then say, you know, you're not angry with me, you're angry with somebody else. No, I'm angry with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think we have to uh, provoke patients. And sometimes what we do for the frame is provoking them. And I'd rather not. But it was a very nuanced response because you uh, uh, didn't, uh, you made a distinction between what was beautiful unto itself. And, yeah. And this yeah. Was a very and what was part of our work. Yeah. And certainly what was part of our work was more acceptable and more important than uh, something she bought at, um, I don't know, Burger of Goodman. So that's kind of transference, yeah. It's sort of a series of questions. It's, my question is, and I'm not a psychoanalyst, how do you work actually with, with the clients that you work with? What is your goal in working with them? How do you bring material out? And how do you even decide if someone needs psychoanalysis? But that's four questions, right? Well, I think that whether somebody needs psychoanalysis, um, you know, it's good for everybody. Uh, but who needs it? The question really is why people come. If they come with a problem to be solved, then you do psychotherapy, and if in the course of the psychotherapy it seems that really there is more they want to go more deeply. They want to change from problem solving to self solving to changing completely. You know, the, the, the difference is that good psychotherapy is wonderful and it really helps people solve a given problem. It solves a situation. It helps them make um, good creative decisions for themselves, it does a lot. There's nothing wrong with, with psychotherapy. It's really good. But it does not do the one thing that analysis does. It does not change the personality the way a patient would like to ideally be changed or change himself or herself. It's, uh, it's a it solves a problem, it solves many problems, it solves a situation. It helps a patient uh, continue a marriage or, or dissolve a marriage. It helps a woman decide whether she wants a child or not. I, there, there are lots of major things that people come in for and it can be done with good psychotherapy. Analysis as far as, you know, I don't think there's a goal in analysis. I, I don't have a goal. And usually the patient doesn't have a goal. But the real outcome, if it's a, a good analysis, is a sense of liberation. It's being free of all of the pressures, the conflicts, the guilts, the shames, uh, the angers, whatever, and the combination of it. And it makes it makes for somebody who feels liberated. Um, we are both a guilt and a shame culture. We always worry about what people think about us and we always worry about what we did wrong. Uh, enough of that. It's, there are better ways to live. There is a way to live where you don't worry about what people think about you. 
and when you don't do a lot of things that you don't want to do or that are not like you because you are afraid of being judged. Uh, there are lots of things you do because uh, other people want you to do it and you don't really want to do it. And you can't somehow manage to get into a life situation where what you want is valid, acceptable, and acceptable to you. Uh, analysis will do that. I know patients usually, and it's been a good one, says you changed my life. Well, I didn't change their life, they changed themselves. So it's A psychoanalyst really is only a, uh, well, he isn't even a guide. He is somebody who makes a, an internal change possible. Whatever, whichever way you do it, by being there, by uh, listening, by understanding, by exploring the reasons that keep people from having the lives they want. Probably all of it. Okay, what else? Have, uh, have you had patients uh, in treatment, in analysis, who were dealing with addiction? Who what? <clears throat> who simultaneously were dealing with an addiction, uh, a drug addiction. I raise this question, uh, a drug addiction, I raise this question because I'm yeah. speaking with an, uh, a psychiatrist, a uh, yeah. uh, wise man, but I asked him if there's anything iatrogenic that we as therapists do, yeah. and he was on uh, of the notion that uh, making sure that you deal with the addiction first. Oh, and there are I, lots of I, things. I, I yeah. Think, and I was wondering, just, and I don't want to, it's more complex than I'm making it out, but just sort of separating it out like that. Uh, have you had I patients? haven't had drug addiction. I've had alcoholism. I've had um, eating disorders. Um, I don't know that you deal with that first. You deal with it as you go along because that's, okay. you, you, it's not a separate issue. It's the way patients solve their problems. It's, you know, all those substances I really substitutes for a person, substitutes for a love relationship, substitutes for being loved, loving, uh, having uh, people around, whatever. It's a substitute. It's a very easy, accessible, quick substitute. And when you begin to, to explore that and why they would settle for a substitute, uh, there is a physiological addiction too, of course. I mean, there is, uh, once you, I used to, but as I said, I haven't worked much with drugs, but alcohol I have worked with a lot. And um, it's very interesting. Some people can't let go for a long, long time and they change a little, and they have periods where they let go, and then something happens, and uh, they were lonely, and they felt uh, rejected, and then they went back to drinking. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. But what, what I try to do is I, I try to analyze, and whenever the drinking comes up, I deal with it and see, to, see whether the patient really understands what, what it means. But it's not the only thing. No, I think you have to take the total patient to the way they come in, whatever it is they, mm -hmm. they bring in. You know, sometimes it's a, it's a problem. And not the drinking, I mean, they, they, they have problems that they want to talk about. They don't want to talk about the drinking. They get up in the morning, they go to work, they drink on the way home and from then on, <laughs> but not. Um, 
So the drinking isn't their problem at the moment. Something else is. And you take it. I think the, the primary thing about analysis is that the patient does it. Uh, you are an aid. You are a, a, um, you are an audience. You are a, a modifier in a way. Maybe you are a, an explainer, tentative explainer. It's always tentative. If you ever make an interpretation, it's tentative. Uh, could it be? It occurs to me. I don't know whether it's right. Um, it may be. Uh, it sounds to me like. But what do you think? <laughs> yeah. And just to follow up the comment you made about taking the total person yeah. as they are, which. I completely embrace and understand. Um, I, I've been working what I think is good work, and the patient thinks it's good work, but she's got um, many multiple dis personalities, according to her. So that's what she's presenting, like 103 personalities. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> that's yeah. what I think, too. Yeah. But occasionally I meet, I mean, occasionally meet all those things that they say happens where the voice shifts, the clothes shift, everything starts changing in the room, and she's got a different name and different information. All of them? That's one. No, not all 103. That's one for each of her years. No, she's not. <laughs> 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 I fell right into that one. <laughs> anyway, I was just curious. It's, it's bizarre to me, bizarre, but I took it and was referred by um, her therapist of many years, who unfortunately um, was dying of cancer, and she had to be seen. And so I took it, you know, I'm a very traumatized person with a horrific background. But she's been trained, um, had had inpatient treatment in a multiple personality disorder program years ago. So I figure other people made this diagnosis and everything. I'm not there to question it. I'm just seeing the total, the total person, but the total person, anyway, I just thought maybe you'd have some thoughts or comments or had had experience with a little bit of this or well, of course the other the, people have? The multiple personalities, um, they have a reason. They can't tolerate everything that they have to, the, the major person, the eye, has to go through. They need somebody else to uh, tolerate or to do or to know or whatever, something else. And actually, each, some of these personalities, in my mind, I don't know if I, it's right to me to judge. I don't try and judge, yeah. or aren't really true personalities. So, like, some of them are named after an abusive incident. Yeah. So it's like um, under the floorboards might be a personality because she was placed under the floorboards in the house one night or something else. Like, so to me, it's it's not. It is. She's all cut up because she's inside. She hasn't integrated, and she doesn't want to lose the personality. Anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off. She doesn't want to lose. She doesn't. She doesn't want to integrate. She has one, the one main person, yeah. and then she has all of these personalities. But they really. But you haven't met all of them. No, 103. Well, <laughs> only worked with her for two years. Or so. You have. You have yeah. met how many? I've met probably six or eight that I'm aware of, yeah. and then probably others, and and. And when it comes out and I'll say, there's been a, a switch, and she says yes, and I say, oh, who's this? And then she'll they'll introduce themselves, and, and then I'll say, well, do you know what's been going on? And they're aware, like the others are hearing, yeah. and, and then that person just takes over the session, or part of a session. And that's one aspect of her. It's her, yeah, that's how I see it. It's Yeah, well, it's... It's not her, too. It's also saying, it's not me. Uh -huh. I am not me. By cutting it off. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's a dissociation, right. essentially. It's, you know, this isn't happening to me. This is happening to somebody else. Yeah? It's just related to Amy's question. Um, I don't work with multiple personalities or dissociations. Yeah. Or, um, but is it at all similar? I just made me think of 
shelf space trying to talk to each other? I've heard you want the personalities to talk to each other. Well, it's it's the same essentially in, in the way that I am not there. It's not me. It's uh, like a little Japanese woman I knew who had very serious dental treatment. And I said something about, you get enough Novocaine. And she said, I never get Novocaine. I said, well, this stuff is terribly painful. How do you tolerate it? And she said, well, I'm not there. It's not <laughs> happening to me. I am just not there. And this is really the, the, the basis of, of the multiples. It's happening to somebody else. Somebody else is doing it. Somebody else is making the wrong decisions, maybe, or the bad, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I am not there. That's the, it's really the, the extended dissociation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going back to the frame and the soft, yeah. rubbery frame. Yeah. Um, does disclosure, self-disclosure, uh, fall into that? Yeah, it does fall into it to some degree. Um, I think there is a way of dealing with it that is not um, quite as rejecting as most. You know, what do you do when a patient asks you? Well, some knowledge is public knowledge, basically. Whether you are married is public knowledge. Whether you have children is public knowledge. It's nothing that uh, they can't get. And right now, you know, I think it's completely gone since the Googling. Mm -hmm. yeah. My patients all go Google me. <laughs> <laughs> sure, they want to know. And by the time they are, fin they are finished, they know more about me than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be ridiculous not to answer a simple question. Mm -hmm. And it becomes by not answering it, it becomes much more important. Mm -hmm. And it's rejection, and it's, it, of course, it does bring up a lot of things that maybe haven't come up yet and are not going to come up. Uh, I'm no good. Uh, I'm not worth it. Um, my mother never would answer a question. Um, it brings up maybe traumatic material. And that, of course, is, is sort of the the real trouble with psychoanalytic thinking that you, you, you are so eager to bring up everything that's, that's there and you want to, to not interfere with anything that uh, would not bring it up and you want to do everything that will bring it up as though the patient didn't have an interest in cooperating in a way, in, in being part of this analytic dyad and really saying a lot of things that they, they do say a lot of things. They will talk about a lot of things. It's, uh, I don't think we need to be so afraid that we'll miss some little bit of unconscious stuff or repressed stuff. And if we are just really careful, it'll come out. It'll come out anyhow. Patients are in there. They are with us when they are with us. Yeah. It's. Uh, I think there is a, uh, this is all a leftover from the idea of the superiority of the therapist and the, and the increased knowledge of the therapist, and uh, it's unnecessary. A patient who is in analysis who keeps two hours a week or one hour or six hours or whatever, and who pays for it and who stays with it and who, if you ask, if you somehow it's understood that dreams are interesting, they will dream. And if you know what to do with dreams, you will encourage it. If you're afraid of dreams, you will discourage it. Uh, well, I mean, you know, there are times when we feel about dreams, I don't really know what to do with the dream. So the patient stops dreaming. Um, it helps if you know what to do with dreams. Dreams are really a wonderful connecting tissue. So uh, that's one of the things I really like about traditional analytic work. 
There's a lot I like about it. Don't think I don't. <laughs> When you think about your adult life, are there any particular people who you can identify who have been particularly <coughs> significant to you in shaping your adult perspective? Other than my 600 children. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was married for 30, 33 years. Uh, I have very close friends that I see once a week, if I can, sometimes more often, sometimes less. There are some that I would not see less than at least once a month. Um, yeah, I have a lot of friends. I just had a birthday party. There were 56 people, and, and there would have been a lot more if it hadn't been in August. <laughs> <laughs> so I have friends, many friends, many students who have become friends, <coughs> and I hate to tell you, but some patients have become friends. Mm -hmm. That's another big one of breaking the frame. <laughs> well, I had an analyst who said that the transference can only be resolved by friendship as the analyst. <laughs> after it's all over. <laughs> and she really believed that. And I remember the first lunch I had to have with her because we're now going to be friends. <laughs> yeah. I was really terribly anxious. In fact, I ran my car into something on the, <laughs> on the way to the lunch. I thought, it, you know, I was really anxious. Yeah. And yet, we did become friends. She, she lived in Chicago. I lived here, so we didn't see each other all the time. But, but I remember when I was in Europe and I got the notice or some, I don't know, letter or whatever, saying that her husband had died. And so I came back and I decided I had some commitment in, in Colorado and I decided to go back to Chicago to see her. And I went to see her, and she was very happy to see me, and we talked, and I spent the afternoon watching Wimbledon and the tennis <coughs> games with her because that's how she met her husband, and she was very attached to Wimbledon. And we talked and talked and talked, and finally I had to catch my plane, and I left, and she said, Thank you. This has been very helpful. And there was the role of reversal of parents. This is when suddenly I was the therapist. And then we stayed in touch for a long time until she got sick and eventually died. But so I have only slight questions about myself when I get into this real deep friendship relationships with some former patients. And in an institute, it's a little uh, difficult not to because you train these people, candidates finish, they stay in the institute, they go on committees, they go on committees you are on, you meet at lectures, you meet at convocations, you meet all the time. And so uh, the frame is broken. And the frame really shouldn't go beyond the actual analytic work, as far as I'm concerned. You can't be a non-entity to somebody who is alive and is a colleague and works the way you do. It's, it's a little insane to, to say that you, know, you, you have no connection. So they see you at the Christmas party. So. <laughs> If it really bothers them, or if anything bad happens, they can always make an appointment <laughs> and talk about it and become patients. And let me tell you, the, the big thing always is, well, you can't do that because if they ever want to come back into analysis, you can't take them after you've gone to the movies or had dinner or whatever. And I think that's because 
people don't think enough about internal objects and external objects. The analyst is an internal object and usually stays one, usually stays there for the rest of one's life, but it's an internal object. It has nothing to do with going to lunch or going to the movies. When the patient comes back, because there are some new problems or whatever it is, they come back, they relate to the internalized an analyst. The transference comes back in some way. Everything comes back that relates to the analytic person, not to the outside object, not to the friend with whom one has shared the errors or, or arguments in a committee or whatever. That's the outside, real life person. But analyzes uh, what goes into your animal is the internalized analyst who is always there, who stays there. And so it really doesn't matter whether you have lunch or whether you don't have lunch or whether you uh, sit in the same committee or not. Um, during the analysis, it makes a difference. There, you really have to be careful. But once that's over, and the analysis is finished, when you are liberated, hopefully, from all the old attachments and difficulties, and when, you've intern when you keep the internal objects that you want to keep and get rid of some of the others, uh, I think it's okay. Analysts are people. They are not, yeah. Um, I, I know you use whatever you find helpful. But this will be our last question, by oh, the way. Thank you. So go ahead. <laughs> it's, it's a quick one. Um, which um, orientation fits best with your personality? Which orientation what? Fits, fits best, which psychoanalytic orientation fits best with your I personality? I don't believe in orientations. Every, there, there are bits of every orientation in what I do. I will occasionally think of Bion. I will occasionally think of... Uh, Melanie Klein, I will occasionally think of, I don't know, uh, <laughs> any one of the people who have made tremendous contributions, but I don't know what I am. <laughs> I really can't tell you. It's, uh, I use what comes, my associations run into just about everybody and usually um, not while I'm talking to a patient. You know, my, I always say that we think about theory, theory being an orientation, only when we don't, when, when we don't have anything inside, when, when something doesn't happen, when there is no internal uh, comment. You know, I, I sit and I listen to the patient and I have associations and I have a memory or I have an image or whatever or a feeling and I know what to say to the patient. Now, this may be a Kleinian one, or it may be a, a self-psychology or whatever, but uh, I don't think of any one of these as more valuable than the other. They go together. I don't know, I was trained as an ego psychologist, but my God, I've added a lot to it since then. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's more what I feel at the moment, but how I perceive our situation. But I think it would be a good thing to say. Uh, silence is a wonderful thing. Analysts can be silent. That's another really great thing. You can be silent. You can wait. You don't play ping pong. You don't have a patient saying something and then you say something and then go back. And that's very liberating for the, for the analyst and it's, I think, very necessary. You have to be able to be comfortable in the, during the silence. And I will just wait and then maybe I will say, where did you go? If I don't get any, if the patient doesn't come back with something. I would say, well, where did you go? Oh, well, uh, okay.
Right. So silence is a good thing. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank you. Thank you for all the good questions. Mm -hmm. you just give us Some the of title, them I what? The title of the book again that you never used. Oh, the, the title of your book that we didn't end up. Oh, this one? Second century of psychoanalysis. Second century of psychoanalysis. It's kind of like. Who is it by? What? Who is it by? It's oh, Diamond uh, and Christian. It's edited by Diamond, Michael Diamond and Christopher Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Michael Diamond and some of the questions. Yeah.